Hi folks, here we go again. Um, today I got a different horse, which happens a lot since we go through a lot of horses here at Ellis Island. Um, this is Cayuse. And what I'm doing is that he was kind of, he's unecked and that's why I call him Cayuse. But anyway, I'm trying to explain to him that he can understand the concept of release. And the way I do that is to back him up. Now I've got a, a nose band on him because he gapped at the mouth really bad when I got him. And that's that's because of humans and no concept of release. So that nose band's gonna go away. It always does. It doesn't last that long with me. And um, he gets nervous when I start asking him to do something because I believe he's waiting for the other shoe to fall. And I've explained to him that there is no other shoe. All you gotta do is give to the re to the give release and then you'll be fine so he's learned that concept and he's actually starting to listen to my seat now this video i'm trying to target for my friend mallory up in montana she's got a dinger in a hackamore and she's done a really good job but she said she's having a hard time with the turnaround so the first thing you got to get to me if you want to get a horse to turn around is for him to walk backwards on a loose rein and once again this is not talking two-year-olds starting colts this is horsemanship so i'll show you what i mean i'm going to put him over here and if you'll watch this part of the neck and especially this part right here and watch what happens when he figures this out as in to give to the bit instead of pushing on it with his nose out with the nose out that's what makes the back hollow and it makes for him hard for them to read your skeleton. As you know, I drop the reins whenever I'm not doing nothing. So now I'm gonna say, excuse me. I did the math on my reins, which incidentally, most people do this. Well, you can just ride one-handed because you're taking your hand with you. If you do this, now you can be independent. So this isn't a hackamore, obviously, Mallory, but it is a bit, and you can do the same thing by bumping the hackamore left, right, left, right. With the snaffle, it's a steady pull. I'm gonna take my knees off, and get that dish in my spine, and look up and ask him to walk backwards. Now, the, one of the things that really surprised me was how he doesn't drag his feet. And when I'm riding outside, I notice he'll kind of get his tail under him, so it's pretty nice that he'll, he's wanting to kind of be on the hindquarter. But right here is the change from three weeks ago. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna sit down and stop. Now my hands are set and he knows what I want already. That's why I stay in the same place. He's bridling up and a big percentage of his brain is on that mouthpiece. So now I'll take my legs off and he'll walk backwards. If he stops, I just put some pressure on it and then I give the rein back. You got to be ready for them to start drifting with their hindquarter and be there with your leg to straighten them out. What I want you to watch is the reins and the slack in them. Now I'll lower my hands to get that vertebrae more. And ask him to walk there. So there's what I was after right there. Now I got to tell him, you're fine. You don't have to be working that cricket all that much. Lower your head, relax. And I'm, and this is a, a little something to critique yourself on. When you're sitting like this, ask yourself, am I still pushing on my stirrups? If your feet are out here, you're, pu you're pushing on your stirrups, which tells your horse you're not done. If you hang on a horse when you're done, and when you're working cattle, you don't send a mixed signal to a horse. Now, if you watch my left knee, you're gonna watch me say, excuse me, he knows I wanna back up. He already knows it. Now, I'll take my leg off, which is my left knee right now. Right knee did the same thing. His hip moved over. Now, his forehand is stepping to the left, so I'm gonna pick him up my left leg and straighten him out. There. I'm pulling like a couple ounces instead of 20 pounds. I'm gonna do it one more time 
just to convince himself and myself. Now I'll sit, take my legs off. He knows what it means. I'm going to move his front end over. Thank you. And I'm going to walk backwards and keep giving him rain. The sooner I can get him to walk backwards on that loose rein, I'm going to be able to move on with the turnaround. There's the loose rein. Now, I'll put my legs on and sit down. Okay, what I believe is a, a portion of his brain, instead of bracing up, he's able to roll that cricket. And he's a good example of, you watch the, the mouthpiece slide up the ring. This is why it's a round ring. He literally picks that mouthpiece up. And that's one of the reasons I made it that way, so they'll, they'll feel it move. And so when the mouthpiece moves by picking it up with the tongue, it is a form of release. And they seem, they get calmer quicker is what I'm trying to say. All right, so now, Mallory, I'm going to set up the turnaround. And the whole thing is when I turn to the right, I'm going to show him the direction. And here's from what I've heard from your email is the mistake. Your left hand has to be forward when you show direction because you don't want any weight on it. All right, when you ask, it all happens at the same time. You'll drop your left seat bone, look to the right, raise your shoulder, and turn your toe out. And as he starts to move, I mean like the skeleton loads up to move to the right, that's when you literally pull straight back on your rein with your elbow against your side and shift him to the hind quarter like that. So I'll set that up right out here. And the object is to not have a horse blow their hindquarter out. I'm going to do it wrong so you can see the hindquarter blowing out instead of the forehand coming across. So now I'm just going to turn back to the right. You see how the rear end walked around in a circle? Now I'm going to ask for the left turn. Right hand. I slowed down the rear end. Now I'll go the other way. I'll do a half halt. Look where I want to go. My left hand pulls straight back and the horse is able to walk the front end across. Now here's another mistake that's made is that when you get to this point right here, a lot of people pitch him the rein, pet him on the neck and say whatever it is they say. Well, that'll come and get you later because when you want a full or a half turn, he thinks he gets to leave. So you stop him dead still. He isn't far enough along to get a whole turn all the way around yet, or even a 180. So I try to get a, a step or two steps and then I stop him. I don't let him walk forward while I'm practicing the turn. Now, I'm not practicing the turn so I can walk forward. I'm gonna walk over here and I'm gonna make a right turn so you can watch my toe. My left hand pulled straight back. My right hand gave him direction. Now my left hand is gonna tip his, I can see his eye. I'm not bending his neck. I mean, I'm bending it a little. Now I stop, pull straight back with my right hand and give them a chance to step over. If they bump their own coronet band, let them because they'll quit doing that. That's kind of what I was wanting to get done. Now, once again, if you'll let go of your reins, you just sit here, it's worth a million bucks. Now, a lady sent me an article about uh, Ed Connell, and she got to meet him. And that's pretty cool that she got to meet him. And anyway, he had mentioned he he wrote for Miller and Lux, and anybody on the West Coast knows about Miller and Lux. And he told him that Ed Connell told the folks that Miller and Lux, when he was riding for him, was running 70,000 head of cattle. They went from the San Joaquin to the Steens. And about 10 years ago, I made a, a derogatory comment about Ed Connell, and it was a really big mistake. I shouldn't have done it, and I apologized for it. Because a lady in Winnemucca got a hold of me, and she says, you know, the fact is, Pat, you can talk about spade bits all you want, but he was riding horses of his time. And what she meant was they were big, tough Broncos, and he was explaining to people how he got by them. 
Okay, that's over. Now another guy can't understand why I use split rays instead of a makate. I'll give you a couple reasons. One of them is, is that I got in Arizona, I found out with the makate where, I, where we live down there, the mesquite trees have a real way of reaching out and grabbing your makate from you. And a split rain, which is what the Southwest Cowboys already figured out, if you hang a split rain up, you can let go of one and still keep the other one. But in a U-shaped rain with a makate, you don't get in a second choice. Another one is, is my left hand, I stuck it in a hay grinder. So it's hard for me to hold a thick makate plus the coils of my rope. And with a split rein, I have the option, without a loop, mind you, what we call a flat hand. Now I can help the horse by doing this and this, which you can do in a makate. That's true. A lot of the horses we get are just like this. They're between 14, 14, 2. If I rig up a makate with the slobber straps and the whole thing, and I have 22 foot of makate, I'm going to have rope dragging out behind me. These are smaller horses. When I worked in Nevada, historically they're big, stretchy horses because there's big, stretchy circles. So it's more conducive over there and it's mainly sagebrush. So that's a couple of the reasons why I do it. And then two, Mexican horses, they're taught to be tied by the reins, which I know you go to cowboy hell for that up here, but I could tie this horse by the rein, come back this afternoon, you'd be standing there. That's the way they're broke, okay? And I've never seen one, you know, whatever is supposed to happen if you do it. But uh, that's, that's my reason why I do it. And the last one is, is I can walk the rein easier with a flat rein in my hand, making one side short and one side long. I can do it easier on a, on a split rein than I can a makate. So I hope that clears me of whatever it is I'm doing wrong. And they're a lot cheaper. Yeah, and these are $30 at Tractor Supply. <laughs> Now, I don't know if you know of the trivia, but the nylon macates over Nevada, they tested all kinds of nuclear stuff and uranium and killed every animal in sight and all that when the government was shooting bombs off. But anyway, they'd have these big giant parachutes with some kind of test deal on them by Area 57. And so they'd leave the parachutes out in the desert and these buckaroos would find them and they'd get all that parachute cord. So the when they went to the nylon macates, it's because they found the materials laying out in the desert. Thank you. So they were cheap too. Well, buckaroos are cheap. <laughs> and uh, that's it. Thank you.